This 10th year of Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Tony Glass, Philip Less, and Daniel Dorado. Coming up on DTNS, the AI search wars have begun. Plus, Apple dishes on its chip cadence, and OnePlus comes with a tablet. This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, February 7th, 2023 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. From lovely Cleveland, Ohio, I'm Rich Straffolino. Deep in the 314, I'm Patrick Norton. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Ah, fantastic, folks. We are ready to tell you about uh, a certain type of AI. There's so many of them, but there's one that Microsoft's very excited about. And everyone else would like to horn in on the fact that everyone's interested in what Microsoft had to say about AI. But first, let's start with the quick hits. Google will add a blur feature to its safe search menu options to help you avoid inadvertently seeing images that it considers graphic. Google told The Verge the feature will be on by default, and you can toggle it on or off independently of Google's main search safe settings. So if you have safe search on, you could just turn the blur off. If you're signed in and over 18 when it launches in the coming months, uh, you can do that. However, safe search is currently the default for signing in users younger than 18. WhatsApp has a feature called status that lets you update your contacts with a video or text note, sort of like Snapchat. A new update to status called voice status lets you record a voice note for up to 30 seconds to use as your status update that may or may not be appreciated by your friends. Another feature lets you choose who can see your status update, and you can now respond to your contact statuses with one of eight emojis. Mm. Last September, we told you about the merge on the Ethereum blockchain. That's the one that transitioned Ethereum from the energy-intensive proof-of-work system to a much more energy-efficient proof-of-stake system. Uh, it basically means that you can validate a transaction based on having a stake of Ether rather than using your computer and its energy to solve hard math problems. However, the merge only worked one way at the beginning by design they're, they're taking it step by step so to begin they said you can add to a stake but you can't withdraw from it at least not yet so the next step is what's called the shanghai hard fork expected in march which will make the proof of stake system fully functional and thus allow the person who put a stake in to pull it out which is one of the motivations of putting up a stake including any ethereum that they gained as a reward for being validators that's the idea you put up a stake you use that stake to validate transactions you get paid a little extra you can pull it out first test network for this final stake Step successfully processed a withdrawal Tuesday, and there are two more simulations on test networks or test nets scheduled before the hard fork happens in March. U.S. District Judge William Alsip of the U.S. Northern District of California ruled Monday against the filing of a class action lawsuit against Nintendo because of joystick drift in Nintendo Switch controllers. The ruling rested on the fact that the end user license has arbitration clauses. Originally, an arbitrator ruled that children had accepted the EULA, or End User License Agreement, not the mothers, and as a minor, uh, that meant that they might not be bound by the terms. But Judge Alsip ruled that the mothers had purchased the devices, so the EULA still applied. A separate class action on the same issue uh, is still pending in the U.S. state of Washington. Since mid-2019, Nintendo has offered free repairs and reimbursements for prior repairs when it comes to the Joy-Cons. And this is an unsettling trend for some folks. As of its latest update, Microsoft Authenticator no longer runs on the Apple Watch. Uh, you can still mirror your Authenticator notification from the iPhone to the watch, uh, but there is not a watch app. Those using the watch to get a second factor code without having their phone with them are now going to be out of luck. The Verge notes some big names have been pulling their Apple Watch apps over the last several years, including Pokemon Go, Uber, and Instagram. All right, well, Apple's Vice President of Platform Architecture and Hardware Technologies, Tim Millett, as well as VP of Worldwide Product Marketing, Bob Borchers, talked to TechCrunch's Matthew Panzerino and said a few things of note about Apple's plans for the future. So, Tom, break it down for us. Yeah, so there was a lot about gaming in there, but I want to focus on the chip cadence stuff. One of the more interesting things he said was that pre-M1, people had begun to question whether Apple was committed to Macs. He's like, we knew that, we heard that, but we were putting all our 
efforts into the M chips. Millet and Borchers say they want to establish a regular cadence now of new Mac chips so that you're not left wondering when the next one is coming. Millet said, quote, We want to get the technology into the hands of our system team as soon as possible and in the hands of consumers as soon as possible. We don't want to leave them wondering, do they not care about us? A new phone ship last year, why didn't the Mac get the love? They, they want to end those kinds of questions. They did say uh, that they don't think it's bad for folks to buy an older M-series Mac because the M-series is so good that it's really only the bleeding edge users that need whatever improvements happen between the versions. Millet added, if you bought a MacBook Pro last year with M1, you're going to be fine. Even if you bought it in December, you're not going to come screaming at me telling me I hate this machine. Why didn't you tell me to wait? Now, Patrick, these two statements seem at odds. Uh, we want awesome new tech regularly, but also it's not so awesome you won't feel bad owning the last version. Uh, can you square that circle for us there? Oh, you're muted, Patrick. Uh, we cannot hear you. So if you can unmute. For there anybody who's an ardent Mac enthusiast, I just want to say I am not trying to be rude, but you know what Mr. Millet said is that it's been a long time since you got the upgrade you wanted, but now look at what we brought you, and which is a way of saying the performance had stagnated because Intel's deliveries on performance on mobile chips had stagnated, and they just kind of like. You know, the, the thing is, is the longer you wait before you upgrade a processor, the faster the processor seems, right? The new processor. And what's beautiful about the, the M1 processors is the performance they delivered was and is ridiculous. Now, the M2 processors, they're talking like a 20% boost, significant graphics boost. Um, you know, I can think of some friends of mine who are a little frustrated. I mean, they're still in love with their M1 MacBooks. But because they spend a lot of time in Premiere and Illustrator and other applications, they would have liked that extra 20%. Um, but it's it's a fascinating argument because um, a, a big thing of what they, they get into in, in, in one of the interviews, I think the original TechCrunch interview, is discussing how advantageous it is, as they figured out with the phones themselves, to have everybody invested in the room. We're designing a product. We want the best laptop on the planet. And one of the things they did was instead of thinking the way most manufacturers, laptop manufacturers have thought, which is like, okay, we'll take Intel's new processor and we'll throw a giant fan on it. And really everybody's going to be plugged in anyway, so don't worry about it. Um, you know, the, the team at Apple were like, you know, people really like to work without having to fight over the one plug in their favorite corner of Starbucks. Mm -hmm. So why don't we actually give them the ability to do something other than, you know, turn off Wi-Fi and watch, you know, read or, or type or any of the things you found. You know, everybody listening has probably at one point or another done something annoying to make their laptop last that much longer. Um, and it's actually, looking at the performance of the numbers, it's kind of incredible what they've done. And then to turn around in such a short span and drop a 20% bump, like, I can see where some people would be cross, angry, pissed. Um, but I also love the idea that Apple's like, whatever we can do, bam, we're going to throw it at you. Which part of me is like, okay, do we now enter a stage where I have FOMO with my laptop every 12 months? Or is it going to be some years they give us 3% or maybe some other features? Other years they give us 20%. I mean, I, I feel like 20% is a huge jump and they're not going to be able to do that that often. But at this point, the performance is so extraordinary. I'm really kind of curious to see where it goes. Rich, you just did this. You you bought the old one right before the new one came out. Uh, yeah, I, I, I bought a, a, a 14 inch uh, Pro uh, right uh, in November, so I'm basically in that same use case. And I mostly bought it just because I wanted a little extra headroom other than the standard M1. So. I really don't need the bleeding edge performance. I want that so that as the machine ages and my use right. cases might change, I'm not pegged in because Macs aren't upgradable. Generally, you do have to overbuy a little bit. So I, like to me, the 20% the performance is like, I didn't need the 100% performance of the old one, let alone this upgraded one. Right. I do think it's interesting though. I mean, you know who mm -hmm. else wanted to have a regular cadence of processor upgrades was Intel. And that was literally the only thing they did. So. At, at some point, it will be interesting to see when there are technical hurdles. We already saw this with, with some of the, the uh, generations of chips that they have coming out. You know, they, they are hitting some technical walls. They had to bring back uh, uh, some technical decisions, you know, kind of back into the lab because they were finding performance issues kind of further in the engineering pipeline of 
Apple is very committed to shipping products, not necessarily shipping chips or shipping, you know, individual sure. tech solutions. They want to ship a product, right? If when they can't hit that product, uh, will they, you know, uh, break that cadence so that they can ship a product when it's quote unquote ready? The, the other part of this interview that caught my eye, they because they talked a lot about gaming uh, and they talked a lot about, oh, we're working with Capcom and working on the API and metal and all the things you normally hear them say. Uh, but they did note, uh, I think it was Millet who said it, game developers have never seen 96 gigabytes of graphics memory available to them until now on the M2 Max. I think they're trying to get their heads around it because the possibilities are unusual. <laughs> um, I, I don't pretend to know what that's going to mean for gaming on the Mac. I tend to think, you know what, gaming on Apple has been the way it's going to be for a long time, which is uh, gamers are mostly located elsewhere, and that's where the game companies are targeting most of their efforts. That's the first time I've looked at something and went, well, 96 gigabytes of graphics memory is unusual. Like, maybe that will turn some heads. Who knows? But how many percentage of people have that? Like, who's going to develop for the Two percent of Mac owners that have that that to yeah. me it's cool. Chicken and egg. Yeah, chicken yeah, and like egg. Yeah, that, that, that's that a to MacGuffin. me is the thing. I mean, that's a MacGuffin in the conversation because the conversation is maybe now that more people actually have functional 3D graphics in their laptops <laughs> yeah, and desktops, the we'll actually pay attention to the Mac market as a place to sell games. Instead, it's like, with 96 gigabytes of RAM, it's confusing and overwhelming all those poor people <laughs> who are using Unreal. Yeah. You know what it's I mean? It's not like, ray like, tracing. It's a, NVIDIA did the same thing with ray tracing, which is they put it in before it was ready, but everyone right. knew that NVIDIA would be in a bunch of machines. So, yeah, nah, I don't know. Uh, let's talk about the OnePlus uh, product line that has been announced. The OnePlus 11 phone debuted in China last month, but it's now available for order in the United States as well. Shipping February 16th, $100 less. You know, in this world of inflation, you don't see prices go down. The OnePlus 11 is $100 less than last year's version, and it's way less than the Samsung Galaxy S23. It's 699 bucks. Has a 6.7-inch screen, 5,000 milliamp hour battery, Wi-Fi 7. Those specs are all better than the S23, but not all of its specs are better. Uh, it can only handle a splash of water. Uh, it's not submersible proof. Uh, it also does not have wireless charging. But still, it's a, it's a very good flagship phone from OnePlus at a very affordable price. Uh, Rich, tell us about the rest of the line. Yeah, they got some, OnePlus had some other stuff that might turn some heads. The OnePlus Pad is the company's first Android tablet. Uh, very much rumored. Now we have some of the details. Has an 11.61 inch, 144 hertz display with a seven by five aspect ratio screen. Sure. Pre-orders open in April in North America, India, and Europe, but we have no pricing on that. Still a little bit away. There's also a wireless mechanical keyboard called the Keyboard 81 Pro, also coming in April, but we don't don't have pricing either. The OnePlus Buds Pro 2 are out uh, in February 16th for $179, and the company teased a foldable device coming in the autumn. Might look like a phone if you squint your eyes, but we're not 100%. Uh, in that regard, Oppo is their kind of parent company. They do make foldables, so we'll mm. see how close those hue to those. Those aren't available in the U.S., however. Uh, Patrick, was there anything that kind of stood out to you? Uh, a swath of announcements from uh, OnePlus here. I thought it was so odd for them to be doing a keyboard, but then again, there's the margins on keyboards can be so huge compared to the margins on phones and laptops right now. I, I, I think it almost makes sense, or phones and tablets. I'm kind of curious to see what else they keep coming up with in the future. Um, it's a pretty keyboard. It does, and it has a knob, and I know it, it's very similar to the Keytron Q1 Pro, uh, a lot of people were saying. I do yeah. like it. They're borrowing like the Surface knob. It's a software programmable I I want tactile controls. I like the tactile controls. I think that's cool. The, uh, I, I know I alluded to it in the read. For the OnePlus pad, that 7x5 aspect ratio, that's squarer, that makes mm -hmm. sense, than a 3x2 screen that they use on something like the Surface laptops. I know those 3x2 screens have been getting a lot of uh, uh, popularity, or at least people are saying, oh, that's an interesting idea, as opposed to a 16x9 screen. You can do kind of two office documents, like side by side, if you're using Word docs or something like that. 7x5, I, I'm sure it's, it might be better for like multi-screen kind of stuff. I know Android is certainly capable of that, uh, but definitely getting into the tablet market. I, Samsung is and Amazon, I guess, are the two market leaders in that space kind of by default. OnePlus knows how to put together, as they show with the phone, a compellingly priced tablet. 
or a compelling device phone, like kind of identifying what the specs people want from a flagship, maybe at a little cheaper price. Uh, so the display seems really nice other than the wacky aspect ratio. So, uh, you know, decently powerful dimensity processor, uh, has a, a 67 watt charging, you know, like a lot of interesting features on that. Well, the pricing is going to be the key on that though. Yeah. Roger pointed so, out that uh, uh, one of the reasons you might have a weird aspect ratio is is a lot of companies like OnePlus just go with the parts they can get. <laughs> and so maybe they got a deal, uh, you know, on this. What was it? Seven, five? Aspect? Yeah. Seven by four. Well, but but also, the thing is, it's a, it's a pretty nice screen. I mean, like that is not to me, that is not just a budget screen. Now, maybe they were able to buy a million of them for super cheap, but like 144. Yeah, no, I'm not saying the screen is cheap. I'm saying mm -hmm. they found a, a supplier that could give them a deal because those screens weren't being used yeah. by anybody else. That's, right. That's true. <laughs> this is I mean, this is not the time I've reviewed a bunch of laptops that came out of, of Chinese sort of century companies in the past. And they're not as obsessed with the 16 by 10 or 16 by 11 aspect ratio the way people are here in the United States. So they're much friendlier to that. Um, something to think about looking at the tablet vendor marketplace or market share worldwide uh, on uh, statcounter.com. 50% of the market share over 50% is Apple 30% is Samsung. A smattering of everybody is like 8% and Amazon is 5%. So it's kind of amazing. 80% of, of tablet sales are pretty much Apple and Samsung. And most of that's Apple. Mm -hmm. Um, They've done, but uh, those those unusual aspect ratios, um, I've actually seen a couple coming out of, of different places where it's fairly sophisticated, spendy products, but mm -hmm. it looks very unusual if you've kind of lived in the, you know, the aspect ratios that we see all the time here in the States. Uh, the one thing, the one other thing to point out is they are kind of maybe going for a little bit of an ecosystem play here, again, expanding into another form factor. They're having an auto connect experience, they're calling it, but similar to what Apple and Samsung are doing, where you're going to be able to pair it with your OnePlus phone and do file transfers. Uh, AirPlay has certainly been a, a, a popular feature for iOS for a number of years now, so not surprising yeah. to see them going for that as well. Well, folks, what do you want to hear us talk about on the show? Uh, you, you like more of this? You like more of that? You got a story you saw that you're like, wait, I want to hear what they say about it. One way to let us know is our subreddit. Submit stories and vote on them at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. All right. Well, right before yesterday's DTNS, Microsoft suddenly said it would have an AI announcement today. That's right. Then right after we finished yesterday's show, Google made an announcement of its own, even though it already had an event scheduled for tomorrow, Wednesday. So we got all the calendar stuff maybe uh, squared away here. Short version, everybody is suddenly in a race to make AI announcements, particularly for conversational models like ChatGPT. You may have heard of it. So let's break down who made what announcements. Tom, get us started. Google announced it will make its conversational AI called BARD open for public testing starting with trusted testers. If you're not testing it, they don't trust you. Uh, then they'll make it available more widely to you untrusted people like me uh, over the next few weeks. But but basically, all of us are going to get to try it over the next few weeks. Uh, Bard is similar to ChatGPT. Uh, it's a conversational AI. It's a, it's a large language model that lets you type in things and it responds. It's powered by a lightweight version of Google's Lambda model. The idea being it'll be a little faster at responding because it's lightweight. And then don't forget, Google still, even after this announcement, has an event scheduled Wednesday live from Paris. And one company we might not be talking enough about is Baidu. They announced plans to launch a chat GPT-like service in March called Wenchin Yiyin, or ErnieBot in English. Ernie is a large-scale machine learning model that's been trained on data over several years. They've been pumping a ton of money into this and will initially be embedded into search. And because we haven't had enough AI coincidences this week, Apple's annual employee-only AI summit has been scheduled for this month. This is the first time employees can attend in person since before 2020. Apple's AI summit is a private event, and while details will most certainly leak, the official announcements of anything discussed there will likely not come until Apple's WWC event, or WWDC event, as Apple calls it, in June. But let's uh, complete the circle and get back to the company that actually <laughs> had an event today. That's Microsoft. Microsoft. Uh, Microsoft addressed reporters about the new capabilities built into Bing and the Edge browser. Uh, Microsoft introduced us to the Prometheus model, 
Prometheus is a next generation large language model that they say is more powerful than the one that's running the public version of ChatGPT. And Prometheus is customized for search. Microsoft says it improves the relevance of answers using the web search index, which is integrated into it. But it also does a lot to make sure it's not acting badly. Microsoft described three levels of safety systems, including fine tuning the model itself, then filtering and monitoring the responses before they get to the UI and the UX. Uh, they have had a red team modeling misuse, trying to get it to do bad things, and they've been using the model to test against itself. Uh, sounds a little bit like a GAN when you do it that way. So Rich, what can it do? Well, there's two main things. The Bing search box can accept up to 1,000 characters. So you can get pretty complex uh, with your requests there. Search results are on the left, on the right shows a conversational answer with links and annotations. So it gives you stuff like where it's pulling the stuff from or where you can go for more information. There's quick feedback, uh, quick feedback button at the top of every search for the system to learn. And then there's Bing Copilot that's being built into Edge. It can execute based on what page you're on. So things like make summaries or compare to other websites without actually leaving the page and even put things in tables and compose posts for LinkedIn, which Microsoft owns. Microsoft will roll out the new Bing interface globally, but slowly. The new Bing is available live today. Uh, you can go to bing.com slash new. It's available on the web and in Edge. Everyone can try a limited number of queries and then sign up for access to full access. You get put on a wait list. Millions of people should get access over the coming weeks. You can get bumped up in line on that wait list mm. if you set Microsoft defaults on your computer. Uh, on my Mac, it asked me to install the Chrome plugin for, for Bing and install the Microsoft Bing app on your mobile phone. Uh, this is very 90s era Microsoft <laughs> activity, if you ask me. Uh, but all right, let, let's get past that because the wait list is only going to be a couple of weeks. Microsoft has fired the first shot in these so-called AI uh, search wars. Uh, Patrick, what do you think so far? I have a lot of feels. Um, I've, uh, <laughs> one, I'm laughing because if I search for browser on my laptop, it tells me Edge. It doesn't admit any of the other four browsers <laughs> on my laptop exist uh, when I'm running Microsoft Windows. Seems odd. Um, but so I think this is a really interesting move for Microsoft. Uh, one, because... You know, I, Bing's, I feel like Bing's search has always been not as good as Google's. We can argue that. I will also say that Google's search is not as good as it used to be, in part because SEO has gotten so good. Or if you are the tinfoil hat wearing friend of mine I was having a discussion with a few weeks ago, that the advantages of, for uh, let's say, economic plays or Google AdSense or any of a number of, of you know, not or very far-fetched theories are the idea that having more, you know, if you search for, I need the dimensions of this part on a 73 blazer, that giving you 10,000 vendors rather than like the one conversation you need from a chat forum about square body Chevys is really what's best for Google. I, I have no particular dog in that fight, except that when I'm looking for information, I do not need to get, you know, some third tier vendor trying to resell the top 20 whatevers from whatever. I think everybody's kind of run into this situation where I search for a projector and instead of getting the review I want, I'm suddenly finding out that Cosmopolitan and Rolling Stone have a bunch of recycled Amazon uh uh, Amazon sort of comments that they are claiming are the top 10 projectors of whatever year we're in. I'm saying all this because the idea that if an AI, if I could touch in a, you know, put in a whole bunch of search characteristics into an AI and it can actually give me the information I want the first time, this is incredibly compelling because I think for a lot of people, other than me searching for obscure data about vintage cars, actually would like to get useful information when they go into a search bar. Um, so if, what, if, one of their if, examples was uh, asking it is my is this love seat going to fit in the back of my Honda Odyssey? And then the Bing search <laughs> engine said, like, well, here are the dimensions of the love seat. Here's the dimension of your usual Honda Odyssey. Tri and here's my estimation of whether it will fit or not. It, it's almost exactly the kind of thing you're talking about. Right. As long as it's not doing the math where it's cut the you know the volume of the love seat into a bunch of small pieces, which when you <laughs> stack them inside the back seat, they will fit, right? Because the thing is, 
downside in that is it hasn't actually figured out the size of the door and the angles, right? Everybody's seen that 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 top ten delivery fails or top ten fails meme where no, it doesn't seem to be doing that. It was giving you a, a direct estimate. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, Rich, Rich, would you were impressed by the edge thing, right? Yeah, the the, the Bing stuff was almost like replicating services that we've had before, like the trip planning thing that they showed off. It was like, there are a ton of trip planning services. The, the, the closing the gap from like intention of search to actual like result that I want is remarkable to close that. But the, the, the stuff in edge really got me thinking, okay, this is going from the more generalized world of chat GPT, which we're already seeing disrupting a lot of ways of generating content, right. And putting it into a situation where this like this is going to be a very mom and pop uh, uh, kind of access point to a lot of this stuff. And some of the stuff they were showing, whether it's even just very simple stuff like summarize this PDF, you know, put these results that In I have context, up on my screen. Right. Yeah. You're looking at it and you're saying, like, compare this to another thing. And without having to leave your page, it would go get that other thing's information and then just give you the answer, which which is fast and efficient and something everybody can understand. Yeah, the, the Microsoft taking their knowledge of how people are productive and where the hangups are in productivity and applying that specifically to AI and integrating that into a browser to me was incredibly compelling where we see the gaps in what Microsoft is promising, as, as we saw with like voice assistants, I'm thinking, and what people can actually do with that will, of course, be the litmus test uh, for this and, and how quickly they can iterate on it as well. Yeah, I tomorrow. Google's going to catch up, uh, whether it's actually in their live from Paris announcement or metaphorically very soon. Like Chrome is going to have this kind of stuff. Google's going to have this kind of stuff. But we're in a race now. I think that's what's most interesting is uh, Bing just became something people were, are going to try because of this announcement. Uh, sky, and then they'll sky, immediately go sky, and check Google. Sky, well, okay, and, and, well, we could just go like, let's be afraid. But I actually think this is really interesting. I, the, I, I think this is an interesting step forward. The most interesting part of it to me was Microsoft openly saying, we don't count as much on search revenue nearly as Google. Mm -hmm. So we can iterate on this super quick. We can take risks on this to make this a value add for people using Bing because we have only places to go but up. We also have a profitable cloud business, unlike Google, that can power all of these searches that they're going on uh, right now. So th those two factors were very interesting kind of back end stuff that they were talking right. about, which may, yeah. you know, kind of uh, limit how aggressively Google can go after this, whatever they show you're, up. You're on. actually going to have a, a, who knows how long it'll last. You're going to have competition for search, <gasps> which you have not had in a long, long Jeez. time. I will also say that Microsoft's rolling out the AI in, in all areas of their business, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. including behind any of a number of 365 projects, it sounds like, or products, I should say. Oh, yeah. Yeah, this is just yeah. one window into what they're doing. That's a really good point. All right, let's check out the mailbag, Rich. All right. Uh Ablo from Twitter uh, uh, wrote in, and I'm sorry, yeah, we have Ablo from Twitter writing in, and he said uh, he's worked in uh, digital marketing for hotels in Southeast Asia, and their teams of three are their teams of three are from three different nationalities there, none of whom are native English speakers. So he wrote in, we usually write SEO articles, 30 plus per month, and social media content with captions for both IG and Instagram. With ChatGPT, I've started to write prompts to rewrite this content, and this is saving a lot of time. I remember during one of the conversations uh, in the shows, it was mentioned that next phase of this would be lessons on how to write prompts and be more like an editor and choosing the right output. And that's what I've started to experience. You will still need the expertise to shift through the outputs and choose the most appropriate, at least for now. But, you know, we're kind of already living in that reality. He says, uh, cheers and keep up the good work. Thank you. Ablo. Mm -hmm. It has Roger. been interesting to watch. Yeah, no, I was, I was, I was, I thought you were going to say something. I was just waiting. <laughs> I'm trying to be a good shell script. No, no, I know, I know you have thoughts um, about this particularly about using these tools to to aid with writing. So when Chat GPT hit, the first thing I thought was like, oh God, here we go again. And the second thing was when a friend of mine sent me something that Chat GPT wrote, and I went, oh, I am being replaced by a very small shell script. Except a very small shell script is a much larger distributed AI, right? Because I write a lot. Um, but I, it's actually been extraordinary because I've dealt with a bunch of, of sort of gig economy. We generate written content for you. And ChatGPT has, in many cases, utterly spanked the human beings. Um, 
you know, <laughs> the grammar's better. It knows how to write a lead. There's a whole bunch of other stuff going on there. So it's been really fascinating to watch this and really fascinating to watch where people have been like, oh, I tried to write a press release. Oh, you know, we've been using it for Facebook stuff. And it's been kind of fascinating because um, there's a lot of uses for this. There's also been cases where it's failed miserably. Um, but it also, you know, we've heard about th the recent debacle with CNET using AI unattributed to generate articles on their website and some other stuff. Um, this is a, a really great big Pandora's box, and I'm kind of really curious to see where it all opens up and ends up. Um, yes, as Tom pointed out, uh, I need to not make Skynet jokes, but in this case, actually, it's really gunning for me. Like when it figures out how to open up a box and review a product, I'm dead. Um, <laughs> I think but, you're going to uh, be fine. I think these are tools yeah. that are that are like most of tools, uh, just going to help us be able to do yeah. new and interesting things. Yeah. But you know, your mileage may vary on that. With with the deluge of of content that this is going to be able to produce, you know what we're going to need really good search. Hey, hey. Think about it. Oh, my gosh. listen, you well, can but, go to Schnooks and buy apples, but Eckert still exists <laughs> because people like to go out and pick it themselves. Patrick, that's I, that's my I, an analogy there. Pick it itself. And also they, they treat their apples better. They don't travel as far. They don't pick them when they're far, far from being. Uh, yeah. So there's uh, right. there, there's 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 it's never humans. We're just we're complex people. Um, we are complex. But so is AI, right? Because you were talking mm -hmm. in Good Day Internet, which everyone should be a member of, um, before the show. But you're talking about how what we think of as AI is so many different things that really are all maybe aspects of AI. But we need to stop referring to all of this yes. generically as AI. If you notice, AI I try to refer to the, the ones today as large language models, not just generically AI, because AI can mean so many different things. Yeah. Uh, Patrick. When folks, uh, when you're when you're not wearing your Eckert shirt uh, or talking about the various AI things to me, uh, what are you doing these days? Uh, you can always find out what I'm up to at Patrick or at Patrick Norton on the Twitters, which seems to not be dying despite anyone's best effort. And uh, you can go to AVXL or search for AVEXCEL on your favorite podcasting tool. Robert Heron and I like to talk about home theater and audio and personal audio and all that kind of stuff. Thank you, Patrick Norton, and thanks to our brand new bosses, Petey and David, who just started backing us on Patreon. Thanks, Petey. Thanks, David. Yeah, Petey, Petey and David made the show happen today. Just that yeah, could be you tomorrow, patreon.com slash DTNS. Oh, In fact, he was just mentioning Good Day Internet, where we're going to be talking more about this kind of stuff. Stick around for that extended show, patrons. You can also catch the show live Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. Eastern, 2100 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow talking about Xbox Game Pass and Scott Johnson's experience with it. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>